I'll just hold it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Wow, that was an amazing introduction. Mm. Um, so first I want to say thank you to Kai Asma um, for inviting me, and I think this event signups is really very exciting. Um, so when I moved to New Zealand in 2007, this is my vision of career success, that the fundamental science uh, discoveries, figuring out how molecules absorb light and then convert that to different kinds of energy would someday get in the tech world. I had never worked with an industry scientist. I had never even done any applied science whatsoever. Um, and when I moved here, um, I had a big surprise because I had clearly very much underestimated the difference between the New Zealand and the U.S. kind of science landscape. And so um, I had to learn all sorts of new terms like full cost recovery and depreciation because the science that I do is quite expensive, sort of millions of dollars. And so in order to make that um, work here, I had to adapt. And so with a lot of strategic planning and discussions and um, oh uh, business cases, which I'd never written before, and proposals, uh, and a bit of nail biting, we finally decided uh, that we would start something called the Photon Factory. And the Photon Factory opened its doors in 2010 with about $2 million of investment in instrumentation and um, facilities from the University of Auckland. And the goal of the Photon Factory was to use the exotic laser pulses that I need to do my research to help science and high-tech industry all around New Zealand succeed. Now, at least one person in the audience remembers that right around 2010, the national government decided to um, transform the science funding landscape and that meant that the types of big funding that would have been available to support the research institute that I was building suddenly were frozen for a while. And so from about 2010 to 2012, we had very big bills and no real obvious way to pay them. And this was a bit stressful. Um, so what did we do? Well, actually what we did is um, essentially I said, oh, yes, absolutely, we can help you to everybody that walked in the door. And the first real commercial project we did was with a US, um, I'm sorry, a New Zealand company called Next Window. Now, Next Window makes optical touchscreens, and they wanted our help to improve the performance by designing a widget that would fit in an existing device, one of these um, touchscreens. And since it was our first project, and as I said, I've never really done commercial research before, we set it up as a two phase project. We said, well, you know, if we can't help them, at least we don't want them to spend a whole lot of money finding that out. So we had a four week, really little money kind of part of the project. And then when we came to a way to help them, we would do a big sort of thing to, to roll it all out. And we worked our tails off and uh, uh, hired the right people. So Peter is a, was an undergraduate engineering student at the time. And we completed the entire project in that first four weeks. So we didn't have to do the big project at the end. The university lost eight dollars on this because they didn't get the big money that came with the, the actual implementation, which they were not all that happy about. Um, but for us, it was golden because Peter was on a patent with the company. We got lots of follow-on contracts. These widgets are actually in optical touch screens; they're being mass manufactured offshore, and um, and we got word of mouth um, uh, statements like that from the company. They were really pleased with how it went. Now, just a few years later, these are just some of the companies that we work with. I can't show you all of them, and that's the sort of mysterious looking guy out there. Um, some companies don't like to tell you what they're doing. Um, but you would recognize many of these. Um, and when the government did come up with a way to, um, to fund science with a, with a strong innovation bent, it turns out that track record set us up really, uh, really nicely to be quite credible. So we have a couple of MBIE grants looking at laser micro machine. And we also get um, investment from the tertiary sector through uh, the University of Auckland and also the Environment Institute and the Dog Wolf Center. These are centers of research excellence that, that I'm a PI in. One example of the types of things that we can do using actually your tax dollars to help New Zealand companies succeed uh, is, is, is seen here with Airpol. So Airpol won one of the 2016 High Tech Awards. And in our lab, Aeropol is the company that uses alumina tiles to make sensors. And they were losing about 60% of their tiles when they went to break them up, so they processed them, and then they didn't work. The throughput was terrible. And so we developed a process, a team of students developed a process that brought them to over 90% um, yield in their products. That was terrific for them. And they're now happy to talk about us as someone that enables their um, excellent growth. And so that makes us feel really good um, and also helps this New Zealand company. Also along the way, something really strange happened. Now, if you told me when I moved to New Zealand that I would be um, in the newspaper for 
sperm sorting by sex, I would have laughed. Um, so we actually have a spin-off company called Agender that does exactly that. For her to give milk, she's got to have a cat. But different cats have different values. And so a farmer would love to be able to dial in um, whether he's going to get a male offspring or a female offspring from, say, the top half of the herd. Okay. Right now, you can't do that very well. And Agender is the company that's going to be giving farmers that capability. And how does it work? Well, we use lasers to move cells around. It's the same forces used by NASA to move cells in space. We just use them to move cells in microfluidic channels. And we also use these microfluidics to protect the cells. The IP in our system is all of the orientation and switching. This is what it looks like right now. So the chip is there in the middle. It's the sort of blue glowy thing. The model going forward is to have a consumable chip. It's made out of hard plastic, sort of an injection molded thing that slips into a device. One bull's ejaculate will then be sorted by sex and put into straws, which is how you sell semen um, uh, if you want to be an artificial insemination company. There aren't that many artificial insemination companies, and we already work with two of the biggest five. I can't tell you who they are. They're mysterious. But they're on that screen. And where are we right now? <laughs> so, we, uh, we are sitting right around the middle of 2016 there. We are about to reach a very important milestone that will tr trigger all sorts of things happening, like another million dollars and million dollars of investment. And then we will be doing IDF and optimizing our chip to make it consumable and blah, blah, blah. So we are looking at actually selling a product in around 2018, but well before that, we'll be having um, our devices on site in these artificial insemination companies generating product for them. There is an existing uh, technology to do this. It's called flow cytometry. Those of you who are in biology probably know that in medicine. Um, it is uh, it's expensive. It damages the sperm uh, a bit more than we do. And, um, and so our customers, which are the artificial insemination companies, are happy with us. And the end users, which are farmers, also are happy with us. The impact is huge. 175 million straws of semen are sold every year. And only about 30% of them are so sorted by sex, and that's because the technology is not that great. So for engender, the rest of them are people who are already using artificial insemination and who would love to have the ability to choose male or female in the offspring. So that's a huge addressable market for us. And conservatively, we can generate 100 million revenue pretty quickly, and our artificial insemination partners um, predict that we'll be acquiring uh, 50% of the market within five years of all of those. That's just in the OECD. Because in the rest of the world that hasn't been using artificial insemination, the, the potential is huge. I love some of them not sex sorted because they don't eat green. Those are the great ones. But the rest are all others. <laughs> so we have a very strong commercialization team that sits alongside our science team. And um, we've got a long-term plan. We won a bunch of awards recently, so Kitty Net Awards. And we actually won an award in Silicon Valley um, in the ag tech sector, so that's all really great. And um, the pig industry is next, and we're already considering um, human diagnostics. Very exciting. But that's not the only one. So it turns out I like entrepreneurship. I like starting new companies and, and, and having my students do these things. And so with David Williams, we've just spun out another company that's looking at doing what we call point of cow diagnostics, measuring the composition of milk, every cow, every milking on farm. That dovetails beautifully with the primary growth partnership project that we've got going on, looking at the same kinds of things with Fonterra milk tests, but at a farm level. So we'll be able to know what's going on all across New Zealand, as well as what's going on on any individual farm with each cow. And that's called the same uh, primary industries champions recently, and I love this screenshot. Um, I picked this one because I think this might be the only time I'm ever in the same video for a chicken call. <laughs> we're separated by two minutes, and we're never in the same frame at the same time, but that's enough for me. <laughs> so what are my thoughts for the future? These days I spend a lot of time thinking and reading about uh, innovation and how to sustain the innovative culture that I've built in the photon factory, and, and how, to, how to have a wider impact than just I can have myself. So this is Bell Labs. And the first thing that I would say is that we need to listen to New Zealand as a problem-rich environment. And I mean problem-rich in the best possible way. There's lots and lots of stuff out there. When I hear people say, oh, I need to get out of my lab and go talk to people about what I can do, I say, no, no, you need to go out there and listen to what people need. 
Because our best projects by far are the ones where somebody's come to us and said, there are five big challenges facing the dairy industry, or I can't make my sensors snap out properly. Okay. Fundamental science is key. I shouldn't have to say this, but I do. I'm not a sperm researcher. <laughs> I'm not an agriculture researcher. The stuff that we do is really fundamental light matter interactions, and it was the expertise there was funded by the National Science Foundation and the NIH in the United States. And that's what led us be able to do a completely novel thing from out of work. This is really important. I work hard to try to make my group fun. Because if students are having fun, like here they're doing a um, this is interpretive dance for a laser mark machine. There are classes that have one there. If they're having fun, they're having they're having good ideas, they're talking to them, they're solving each other's problems. And, and that fits with the last thing, which is one of the most valuable products of the photon factory, and the main reason I'm in a university, is the people that leave, the people that are trained. They come into the lab, they, they spread their wings, they learn how smart they are, they learn how capable they are. You learn how smart and capable you all are. And when you go out into New Zealand, into existing companies, you make them better and more effective. You make them make more money, you make them have better products. And when you help spin out a company, you're also creating your own job. So for me, the best part of all of this is the students, the people like you guys that come through the system. Thank you.